Hello, this is Mark Tooley, president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy, delighted to host today the annual worship service of LifeWatch, United Methodism's uh, pro-life caucus, commemorating the 48th anniversary of the Roe v. Wade decision by the Supreme Court in 1973. Typically, this service is held in the Methodist building on Capitol Hill, but of course the pandemic has uh, made everything a little bit more difficult. So Paul Stallsworth, the head of LifeWatch, has uh, traveled all the way from North Carolina to be here in the IRD office to give the annual LifeWatch address. If you are listening in, please put yourself on mute because we can hear everything you're doing there sitting in your home. And if you do not mute yourselves, we will have to uh, take our own extreme measures against you. So don't uh, force our hand in that regard. This video will be posted on the IRD website and social media, as well on LifeWatch's website and social media. So be sure to share this video with your friends afterwards. So Paul Stallsworth, uh, distinguished United Methodist minister, LifeWatch, thank you so much for giving this address on behalf of uh, your organization. Many thanks to you, Mark, and welcome to the 2021 LifeWatch sermon. Not so much service, but sermon uh, this time around. And again, our location is the world headquarters of the Institute on Religion and Democracy here in Washington, DC. And Mark, we are very, very thankful for the hospitality that you and IRD are showing. We're very, very thankful. And what a distinguished little congregation we have this morning. This is just fantastic. Very, very thankful that you will be uh, sitting in. And thank you for joining us this morning. We're grateful that you have be chosen to be a part of this. Very grateful for your presence. The annual LifeWatch sermon is usually, of course, held at Simpson Memorial uh, Chapel in the United Methodist Building on Capitol Hill. But COVID cometh, and therefore this new venue. In his recent book, Live Not By Lies, Rod Dreher declares, and I quote, the essence of modernity is to deny that there are any transcendent stories, structures, habits, or beliefs to which individuals must submit and that should bind our conduct. To be modern is to be free to choose. What is chosen does not matter. The meaning is in the choice itself. There is no sacred order, no other world, no fixed virtues, no permanent truths. There is only here and now and the eternal flame of human desire. Volo ergo sum. I want, therefore I am. According to Dreher, modernity denies that there are transcendent stories that are significant. Transcendent stories that profoundly affect our lives today. Well, a few of us believe that modernity is, to use Dreyer's word, a lie. Modernity is a lie. If modernity is a lie, then transcendent stories do exist. There are transcendent stories to which individuals must submit and that should bind our conduct. 
Well, here we are in the middle of American modernity in Washington, D.C. Let's you and I do something really radical. Let's turn to two transcendent stories from the New Testament, one about Mary and the other about Joseph. Listen to two stories about young people responding to the divine message spoken by two angels. First, Our Lady. And this from Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Second, Joseph. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as 
his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. The angels speak the word of God to Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph respond in three ways. They listen, they trust, and they obey. First, Mary and Joseph listen. Espoused in the first century Jewish world of Galilean peasants, Mary and Joseph are well on their way to living a conventional, respectable, responsible, simple life. Then the angels arrive and announce disruption. Unplanned pregnancy, birth of a son, one named Jesus, one who will be great, one called the Son of the Most High, one who will rule from the throne of his ancestor David, one who will save his people from their sins. The angels bring news that is disruptive. When confronted by an angel of disruption, Mary is perplexed and afraid, puzzled and fearful. When confronted by his disruptive angel, Joseph is simply consumed with doing the righteous thing, quietly dissolving his relationship with Mary, sparing her from the big shun and worse. Instead of doing what they want to do, what they feel like doing, Mary and Joseph listen to the angels. Neither protests. Angel, I am too busy for you. I have too many plans for this. What you are saying is crazy. Your words are upsetting me. Please leave. I have already made up my mind. I know what is right. Go away. Mary and Joseph, listen. Second, Mary and Joseph trust. After listening to the angels, Mary and Joseph must have been ready to run to a best friend or to steal away to a faraway village or to escape to a hiding place in the hills, but they do not. Though made very uncomfortable by the angels, they stay put. Mary stands there. Joseph lies there, sleeping no less. And the word of God from the angels works into their hearts and minds. A child is on the way, a unique child who is from God, who is God, who will be Emmanuel, God with us, a savior, a ruler. This word of God is the truth to Mary and Joseph. God's word, the truth, wins their trust. Third, Mary and Joseph obey. Mary and Joseph listen to the angels, then they trust God's word, 
from the angels, finally they obey. After the angel finally stops talking, Mary responds, here am I, the servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to thy word. Mary agrees to receive and carry and birth and raise and follow and suffer for the promised child. Mary obeys. Regarding Mary's obedience in Luke 1, Reverend John Wesley speculates, it is not improbable that this time of the virgin's humble faith, consent, and expectation might be the very time of her conceiving. Later, when the angel finishes speaking into Joseph's dream, he wakes up. He wastes no time. He does exactly what the angel commands. He takes Mary as his wife. Joseph obeys. So, responding to God's word, spoken by angels, both Mary and Joseph, in their unique ways, listen trust, and obey. Their listening leads to their trusting, and their trusting becomes their obeying. I'll add just a couple of observations about Mary and Joseph's obedience and what that obedience looks like. First, the obedience of both of them involves togetherness. Mary receives Jesus as her baby. Joseph takes Mary, who was with child, as his wife. Their obedience brings people together. It does not separate and distance and isolate people from each other. In bringing people together, Mary's obedience and Joseph's obedience reflect Emmanuel, which means God with us, because God is indeed with them and with us. Mary and Joseph, are called to be with others. Mary with Jesus, Joseph with Mary and child. Second, this togetherness involves difficulty. It is not warm and fuzzy. All of us know that just before he died, Reverend John Wesley declared, the best of all, God is with us. United Methodist ministers today retell that story often. We repeat the story probably to help our churches feel good. However, God's togetherness, God's being with us, demands much. When God, through Jesus Christ, joins us, Christ emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2. You might say that Christ's obedience to his Father to join us in this world 
points downward from heavenly majesty to earthly humility. Likewise, Mary's obedience, her togetherness with her son, points downward from a life she planned just like she wanted to a life that she accepted. Likewise, Joseph's obedience, his togetherness with Mary, points downward from a life that had good appearances, respectability, to a marriage with a very questionable start. When God joins us, when God is with us, when Jesus and Mary and Joseph are obedient to God, their direction turns downward. The going gets rough. Sacrifice is in. Listen, trust, and obey. And this obedience demands togetherness and downwardness or sacrifice. Just remember Mary and Joseph and even Jesus. What about today? How do listening, trusting, and obeying fit into life today, into modernity? Three illustrations. First, a young, stable, married couple discovers that a child is on the way. They are thankful. Midway into the pregnancy, the parents are told by their doctors that the child has a very rare and mortal disease. Okay. I'll go over here, click that. Down. The child will be born, then okay. he will soon die. So the medical authorities suggest abortion. What should the couple do? Go away. Long, <laughs> difficult, Discussions follow. Long, sleepless nights occur. There is anger and uncertainty and dull pain. And finally, finally, peace. After much consideration and prayer, they decide to welcome their child and love him as long as possible. So the child is born, Step on the, the tiny son is loved by mother and father. On top. He is perhaps baptized by a hospital chaplain. See the pig speaker full screen? Tragically and sadly, the newborn son is that what you dies want? from the disease. No. In a matter of days, a service of death and resurrection is held for the little one. He is offered to God's mercies, trying to figure out who's talking. his soul to the communion of the saints, and his body to the ground to await the genera general resurrection at Christ's return in glory. As this story unfolds in real time, God must be speaking. And mother and father are listening trusting and obeying. Their obedience is difficult. It is hard as nails, but they do what is right and what is difficult. They welcome their little one. Then they offer their little one back to God. The year is 19. 58, a young woman in Italy becomes pregnant with her first child. The mother is hospitalized with a common ailment. Doctors advise her to be rid of the child who will be born with some disability. 
a devout Catholic Christian, she continues to carry the child. Her son is born with congenital glaucoma. He is completely blind at the age of 12. But also he has what has been described as the most beautiful voice in the world. Andrea Bocelli, his song, With You I Shall Leave, is one of the best-selling singles ever. And his Sacred Arias album is the best-selling album by a classical artist of all time. Day after day, Bocelli tells his story and his mother's on a video that is watched by thousands. Mrs. Edie Bocelli, she listens, she trusts, she obeys. She welcomes and raises her son. She humbles herself. And we cannot help but think that her son, Andreas, also listens, trusts, and obeys in a unifying and sacrificial way. Third, consider a counter example of listening, trusting, and obeying. Even years ago, the sexuality debate is jostling the United Methodist Church. A seminary holds a public event on this topic. Several professors and an activist revisionist sit on a panel and they make presentations. Many students and probably others eagerly sit to take it all in and to learn. The professors are, as you would expect, thoughtful and sophisticated, but they talk about their own opinions. They do not give serious attention to biblical witness or church history or church doctrine. From the perspective of today's sermon text, one might say that the three presenters do not first listen and trust and obey before they make their presentations. Instead, they take for themselves supersized roles they demonstrate to their audience how to silence, how to silence God's word, replace church doctrine, and allow the freedom to choose ethos run wild in the church. Their presentations and their examples might actually render some of their listeners incapable, incapable of listening and trusting and obeying the word of God with regard to human sexuality. This is a great, great sadness. Well, I could never do that. I could never listen to, trust, and obey God's word for the good of others and at my own sacrifice. I just couldn't do that. I'm not built that way. Well, on our own, by ourselves, apart from God's grace and Christ's church, that's correct. On our own, we cannot follow Mary and Joseph's example of listening, trusting, and obeying. 
However, we can do things that help prepare us to do what we think is impossible. Regularly attend a local church, a local church who's listening and trusting and obeying. Receive Holy Communion as often as possible. Stay close in fellowship with a small group that holds us accountable. Do things. And listening, trusting, and obeying become possible. Be warned, along the way, we will fail. We will fail. We will listen to the latest podcast opinion. We will trust the self-help section at our local bookstore. And we will obey our own desires. We will fail. We will sin. Yes. When we sin, fear not. That boy who was carried by Mary and defended by Joseph, died on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins. He was raised from the dead so that we might turn from our sin and toward God for new life. So that we might listen and trust and obey. One more thing. God and the angels, Mary and Joseph, went to a lot of trouble to see that Jesus was born. Now, can you imagine the church gathered around the risen Christ backing the notion that children are just a matter of choice. Nor can I. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this occasion for this space, for your word, for the call to each of us, which humbles us. Time and again, O God, you have come to us and lifted us and forgiven us and sent us out again. And we are grateful. We are thankful that you have accomplished this in your son, Jesus Christ. Open our ears. Throw open wide the door of our hearts. And may our wills be captured by you for the sake of obedience. All of this we pray through Jesus Christ. And God's people said, Amen. Again, Mark, thank you.